My parents do not like to text. But when they do, it's usually to alert me to some breaking medical news. They seem to have forgotten that I'm a, I'm a doctor and a researcher. What they send me tends not to be rigorous studies from medical journals. Instead, is something they've seen on Facebook or forwarded WhatsApp messages from one of their friends who found it in some distant corner of the internet. Whether it's a mir miracle diet or a terrible medication side effect, one thing's for sure, it's an article with a screaming headline. And once you're done screaming, to share it with everyone you know. Among the things that have changed over the past 50 years is the fact that the internet has become the primary source of medical information. It used to be that we had some kind of medical encyclopedia around the house. You know, a big bulky book that looked like a dictionary. We took it down whenever we were trying to figure out if we were sick enough to see the doctor, or to remember exactly where the appendix is located. Huh. It's right there, by the way. Nobody does that anymore. Hardly anyone has that book. Instead, what we have is Google. Pain in the side, Google it. Weird looking thing in the face, Google it. A new diagnosis from the doctors, all together now, Google it. Let me be clear, there is nothing wrong with Google or the internet. As a health professional, I actually see it as a good thing. The more people know about healthy habits and disease prevention, the more likely they will adhere to their medication or even adopt a healthier lifestyle that would mean that they don't even need medication in the first place. But the internet also did the opposite. The digital age has allowed for unprecedented amount of medical misinformation to reach millions. And now the question is, can we even stop the spread of bad information? Let's be clear about the problem. It's not just that bad science is out there, it's that it spreads wider and faster than fact-based reliable information. A 2018 study showed that fake news and questionable science spread further and faster than the truth. It also showed that stories that inspire fear, disgust, or surprise were more likely to be spread than stories that inspire joy, hope, or trust. We may want to blame the algorithm. As it turns out, it's still humans who are behind the spread of bad information, medical or otherwise. But we also share good information because we care about each other. And that brings me back to my parents' medical update. They are not sending me stuff to scare me. They are sending me stuff that scared them, passing on intel that seemed urgent and dangerous, because in their heart, I'm still their little girl. And that's what makes it tricky, because it might be, it might be something I need to know. Let me give you an example of this from my medical practice. A patient of mine had very high uncontrolled blood pressure. A normal blood pressure, 120 over 80. And hers was 180 over 100. She was in serious danger. So right away, I put her on a medication to bring those numbers down, which she did not take. Why? Because a friend of hers had seen something on the internet about it causing cancer. Fearing that, she did what? any one of us would do. That's right, she Googled it. And yes, as she told me during her next clinic visit was that she did find an article connecting this medication with cancer. She told me, there is no freaking way I'm gonna take this medication. <laughs> I was surprised. This medication is prescribed all the time and has been around for ages. I'd heard nothing. But she Googled it and found something. She showed me. Look, it's right here on my phone. I could see it for myself. I told her I'll look into the research and I did. What I found was, in reality, there was a study showing potential increase in cancer risk in mice. That's right, if you're a mouse, it's clinically proven that you should not take this medication. But my patient is 
humans. <laughs> and the article she Googled had failed to mention that there had been extensive studies showing no connection between this medication and cancer in humans. After that, her risk of dying from stroke was far higher and much more of an immediate concern than her ever developing cancer. So I sat her down and walked her through this. She felt relieved and decided that she would continue with the medication. She still alive today. And that's what we all need to do, to not take things at face value. But it doesn't help if we simply don't listen. Because like my parents, this patient was genuinely worried. People share things they've seen on the internet for many reasons. One of them being that they care about us. And that's not a bad thing. But the fact is, the receiving and using of data, any type of information, is not an effortless process. It requires all of us to do the work. And the work starts with looking beyond the headline, which is not what most of us do most of the time. A few years ago, the satirical news site Science Post published an article with zero content. Anyone trying to read it will find themselves looking at a block of nonsensical text. But they attested to this headline. Study. 70% of Facebook users read only the headline of science stories before commenting. <laughs> this article was shared by 46,000 people. This headline, these people saw the headline about not reading the article and did not read it. This happens all the time. Recently, a study from Columbia University found that nearly 60% of links shared through social media have never actually been clicked. This is how medical misinformation gets spread. We see the headline, we share. We don't read the article. I've done it myself. There are times where I retweet without reading the full article I'm sharing. When we think about what we can do to stop the spread of medical misinformation, here are three simple things we can do. Step one, read the article. <laughs> That's the single simplest thing we can do. Next, step two, check where the information is coming from. Check the source. Who did the study? Who funded it? When was it done? How many people were involved? And that gets us to step three, the data itself, which is the most important but for some, the most challenging part to make sense of. Not everyone, of course. If you're the sort of person who heard the word data and go, hmm, delightful, well, you know what to do. But if you're not, if you heard the word data and felt a part of your brain shut down, <laughs> hang on, stay with me. Here's how anyone can approach data. Start by looking at the size of the study the size of the pool involved. In school, we knew this as the sample size. No matter how complicated the data gets, it all boils down to the sample size. Let me give you an example. Let's say you saw an article about a study saying that 60% of kids who drink from water fountains get chickenpox. Ooh, that sounds serious, and it is. Chickenpox is no picnic. But it's important to not stop at the headline that says, Water fountain must be banned. Look for the sample size. How many kids are we talking about? How many water fountains? If it's five kids, one water fountain in one school, the fact that more than half of them had chicken pox is not a public health emergency. It might not even have anything to do with the water fountain. And that's the power of the sample size. Most of the time, most of us never get that far. We see the headline, we freak out, and then we share. And that's what I want to leave you with, to ask you to try to stop doing that. I'll do the same. When we share information, let us pledge to resist the urge to share out of emotion. Let us resist the urge to root out studies that confirm what we already think, want to think, or want to feel. Let us agree to do that three things. Read the article, check the source, and then dig into the truth about the sample size behind the data. 
And once you've done that, and you still feel as worried as you were when you first saw the screaming headline, then it might be something we all need to worry about. Thank you.